uh, anyway, as everyone is uh, joining and sorting the audio out, I'm going to slowly make a start. Uh, so thank you all for joining and thanks also uh, for anyone who donated. Uh, we do collect donations for these. Obviously, you're more than welcome to attend completely free, but we uh, do collect donations which, uh, from which 75% go to a designated charity and the rest we keep on events like this. Um, so all donations are always very much appreciated, so thank you. Uh, great, so uh, for tonight's uh, virtual Café Sci, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the format, we're going to have a um, relatively short talk first um, from an expert speaker. And after that, you'll have a lot of chance for um, to ask all of your own questions. Um, you can either do that in the chat or if you wish, uh, you can come on camera and on screen as well afterwards. In case you didn't hear me earlier, just so you're aware, the event is recorded. Um, you will be able to, uh, we will put this on YouTube afterwards and you will be able to um, pick it up if you missed anything. Uh, so yeah, it's my pleasure to um, introduce our speaker for tonight. So we've got Emily Stevenson here. Um, she's, some of you may know her as the one of the co-founders of Beach Guardian, um, the uh, NGO that um, does a lot of beach cleans and empowers communities to tackle plastic waste. And this is something she actually talked about for us, uh, talked for us about um, about two years ago. Uh, but today is not about that, and I could go on about her CV uh, and more and more. She's had awards from the Prime Minister, and the Diana Award, but today is all about microplastics. So um, Emily's starting a PhD at the University of Exeter in Penryn, um, all about uh, microplastics and microbiology. So I think I'll leave it with there at that short introduction and um, let you pick it up, Emily, and tell us what your work really is about. Great. Thanks so much, David, for such a lovely introduction, and thanks, of course, for inviting me to speak this evening. It's really lovely to see all of you and hopefully, um, you know, we can cover all of my research. You'll have lots of questions at the end uh, to kind of open up the discussion. So as David said, um, uh, many of you may know me as the co-founder of Beach Guardian. So with Beach Guardian, we, our primary aim is to engage, educate and empower against plastic pollution. And we do this through a lot of beach cleaning and, and working in schools. But I'm not actually going to be talking about Beach Guardian today. I am still going to be talking about plastics as I rarely stray further away <laughs> from plastics. But as David says, I'm going to be talking about my PhD research. So just a little bit of background of my academic journey so far. So I studied marine biology at the University of Plymouth from 2015 to 2018. And then I studied my master's here at the University of Exeter in conservation science and policy from 2019 to 2021. It was supposed to be a one year master's, but uh, COVID threw a little bit of a curveball in there and I hung on for an extra year. And then I started my PhD here at the University of Exeter in collaboration with Plymouth Marine Labs at uh, September last year. So, my presentation this evening is going to be about what I've been researching for my master's, but also what I'm investigating in much more detail now for my PhD. So I'll just do the uh, compulsory, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see this okay. Let's just get it into a bigger format. How's that looking? We can see the presenter's view on our end, I'm afraid, Emily. Is that with notes? Yeah. Okay, let's try this. How's that? Yeah, that's perfect. Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, today I'd just like to talk about my research investigating microplastics as vectors of antimicrobial resistance in aquatic systems. And that is a bit of a mouthful. So we will be going through my research step by step and I really want to start with the basics, uh, really sort of, sort of setting the scene so that everybody starts off at the same level of understanding. Um, I will go on to some more complex areas of my research later on in my presentation, but hopefully um, with the background, it should all make sense. But of course, if there's anything that doesn't, you can ask questions later on in the presentation. So as I said, this is my PhD research and it's supervised by the University of Exeter. My supervisors are Professor Angus Buckling and Dr. Amy Murray. And then I'm also um, collaborating with Plymouth Marine Labs and my supervisors there are um, Professor Pen Penny Lindeque and Dr. Matthew Cole. 
So throughout my presentation this evening, I'd like to go through a series of questions really, and hopefully we can sort of answer them together. And the first kind of area that I'd like to an answer and address is what are microplastics? What are bacteria? What's antimicrobial resistance? And how do they all kind of interact with each other? And then the following questions after that are what I'm really going to use to formulate my PhD thesis. So I want to know, are microplastics uh, colonized by disease causing bacteria? And a lot of this will make more sense as my presentation goes on. And then do microplastics influence the evolution of drug resistance? And then finally, what does that actually mean for the wider environment? Can these microplastics then carry drug resistance or potentially disease causing microorganisms into different environments? So those are the kind of overarching questions that I hope to answer today with my presentation. So as I say, I'd really like to, to set the scene firstly. Um, there were, as I said, there was going to be some kind of high level um, ideas that I talk through later, but I thought it's really important to, to start at the very basics. So first of all, what are microplastics? And when we talk about plastic pollution, Everybody knows, you know, thanks to Sir David Attenborough and Blue Planet and the general media, everybody knows that plastic pollution is a severe issue, both on environmental health and also human health. When we think about plastic pollution, we usually think about, say, plastic bottles, for instance, in the environment and the larger items getting into the ocean. It's estimated that up to 12.7 million tonnes of plastic is entering the ocean every single year. So you can see why people would think about the larger items of plastic getting into the environment. But actually, the microplastics are the most prevalent plastics that we find in the environment. So microplastics, by definition, are any plastics less than five millimeters in size, so half a centimeter. And just to kind of put into perspective how prevalent they are, many people, um, I believe last year, watched the documentary Seaspiracy. And in Seaspiracy, the overarching theme was to say that plastic fishing gear was one of the most um, polluting types of plastic pollutions. One stat that was most frequently used throughout that documentary is that 46% of plastic in the ocean is fishing gear, which is true. I went back and I've looked at the study that, that found this. This is a study that looks at the Great Pacific garbage patch um, and 46% of the plastic in this patch by weight is fishing gear. By weight, 8% of that plastic are microplastics. But if we look at those thing, those um, quantities again, but instead of looking by weight, we look by number, 94% of the Great Pacific garbage patch is made up of microplastics. An estimated 3.6 trillion pieces of plastic just in that one area of ocean. So you can begin to see just how prevalent these particles are in the ocean. And then, as I say, my research looks at bacteria and drug resistance in bacteria, but what are bacteria? I think when people think about bacteria without being microbiologists, they have very kind of mixed views on what bacteria are or, or where they exist, whether you come from a human health perspective and thinking about bacteria in the human body, and it's estimated that 10 times uh, we, in, our, in our bodies, we have 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells. So bacteria <laughs> outnumber um, our own cells. Or if you come from an environmental perspective, you know, bacteria are incredibly important in the environment and hugely kind of involved in some really key um, biological cycles in the environment. For example, in the ocean, if you were to kind of sample a liter of seawater, just in one liter, there can be up to a billion bacterial cells. So they're really important microorganisms that are present both in humans and in the environment. 
And people also have kind of mixed views on whether bacteria are good or bad. Of course, you have some bacteria that we call pathogenic. So these are disease causing bacteria. But then you also have bacteria that are totally harmless or indeed good for our bodies. You know, lots of people who are doing sort of crazy dieting or thinking they're drinking those probiotic yogurts, for example, they try and use the benefits of bacteria for their health. And a bacteria that is harmless to humans, but present in our system are called commensal bacteria. And this is all going to be important later in my presentation. Now, one bacteria that I'm going to focus mostly on today is E. coli. And E. coli are these beautiful cells that you can, are these beautiful colonies that you can see on the screen here. These are some of my um, E. coli I've been growing in the lab. And so E. coli is a gram negative bacteria. And as I say, E. coli exists as totally harmless bacteria, but also pathogenic, so disease causing. Within E. coli, we have seven different groups that we call phylogenetic groups. And five of them, totally harmless, they exist in most healthy humans, but then we do have two disease causing groups. And again, that's gonna be important later. Now, E. coli is responsible for causing urinary tract infections, meningitis, and is the most common cause of bloodstream infections in humans. So those two pathogenic groups can be really quite um, concerning for human health. But also, E. coli are important in the environment too. E. coli are the organisms that we call fecal indicator organisms, which means that we can use them as a marker for microbial pollution. So for example, down here in the Southwest, we quite often see where we have sewage um, uh, uh, overflowing into the aquatic system. And we can see just how severe that pollution is by monitoring the levels of E. coli because E. coli are highly prevalent in sewage. So they're a really important microbe for, for researchers. And then finally, um, the final thing that I just need to sort of set the scene with and provide the background with is drug resistance. So when I talk about drug resistance or antimicrobial resistance, we're talking about lots of different antimicrobials. So these are antibacterials, also known as antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitics. And almost self-explanatory, these drugs are used to treat infections from bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. For my research, I'm predominantly interested in the antibiotics, so used to treat bacterial infections. Now, drug resistance is where a microorganism evolves the ability or inherently has the ability to multiply or persist in the presence of in the presence of an increased level of antimicrobial. So, for example, if I had a drug resistant E. coli infection and I tried to treat it with antibiotics and it would continue persisting in, in my body, that E. coli would be resistant to those drugs. And I won't go into too much of the, the nitty gritty of how these organisms evolve drug resistance, but something that's really important for what I'll go on to explain later is that essentially more resistance will evolve the greater that there is a, a selection pressure or, or so basically where you have the presence of an antibiotic, for example, whether that be in your body or in the environment, then the microbes that are exposed to that antibiotic will likely evolve um, drug resistance. And historically, people think that, you know, the greater the concentration of this antibiotic, for example, the more likely you are to, to evolve resistance. But research from my supervisor, Amy Murray, here at the university has found that even very low concentrations of antibiotics, for example, those that are found in the environment, can cause the evolution of drug resistance. So I'll say a lot throughout my presentation today that where we have a selection pressure, we see evolution of resistance. And that selection pressure is just the presence of an antibiotic. 
So that's kind of setting the scene and really highlighting the basics there to what my research is being informed by. But how does it actually come together? Where does my research sort of fit into that? So both microplastics and antimicrobial resistance are significant threats to both human and ecosystem health. And as we've already discussed, microplastics are extremely prevalent in the environment. It's estimated that up to 51 trillion microplastics have already accumulated in the ocean. That's more than the number of stars we have in our galaxy. So really unimaginable quantities of these particles. And antimicrobial resistance is one of the greatest threats to modern medicine. Currently, there's 5 million deaths per year directly caused by or attributable to bacterial antimicrobial resistance. So we have these two huge threats facing environmental health and human health. And it's the combination of these two that I'm interested in, in researching. So to begin to understand how microplastics and antimicrobial resistance interact in the environment, we have to think about how do they both get into the environment? How do microplastics end up in the environment? How do these antibiotics end up in the environment and creating the selection pressure for back, um, environmental bacteria to evolve resistance? So the sources of microplastics are incredibly varied. So when we talk about the different types of microplastics, they can be divided into primary and secondary. Primary microplastics are made to be small in size. So for example, um, nurdles are the pre uh, production pellets for plastic pollution. So these are tiny little plastic pellets that are made to be small in size and they're used to make bigger plastic items or microbeads, for example, in cosmetics. So they're made to be small in size. And one of the greatest sources of primary microplastics into the environment is wastewater. It's estimated that 25% of microplastics in the environment have originated from wastewater, so um, sewage. And uh, some research has suggested that for just one wastewater treatment plant, it can emit up to 300 million plastic particles every single day. So that's primary microplastics. Secondary microplastics are larger items that have broken up to be small in size. So um, a plastic bottle that has been exposed to wave action or UV and degrades into these smaller and small to smaller particles. So we have primary and secondary microplastics and there are many inputs for both to enter the environment. But then when we look at antimicrobials, so antibiotics, for example, the sources of those to get into the environment massively overlap with the sources of microplastics. So I've just marked on with an X here to show where antimicrobials, so antibiotics may be getting into the environment. And again, wastewater is hugely important, uh, an important source for antibiotics to get into the environment, like with the microplastics. So for example, when a, a human ingests an antibiotic, it's not fully degraded in their body. So it will go into the wastewater and the waste, wastewater treatment plant. And wastewater is, the treatment processes are unable to fully degrade um, the antibiotic. So it ends up going into the environment. So we have many instances where we have microplastics and antibiotics coexisting in the environment. And if you remember back to the start where I was talking about E. coli, E. coli is incredibly prevalent in our sewage. So we also have E. coli, microplastics and antibiotics all in the same environment. Now, what's really important for my research is the concept of a biofilm. So 
everybody's probably heard of a, a biofilm before, you just might not know about it. So um, dental plaque, for example, or pond scum, it's basically this highly concentrated mass of microbes living together. And microplastics, when they get into the environment, they become colonized by a biofilm. So this highly concentrated sort of microbial reef of all different kinds of organisms living on these microplastics. So as I've already said, we've got the microplastics potentially colonized by loads and loads of E. coli. And we also have this selection pressure of the antibiotics in the environment too. So it's that kind of interaction and this coexisting of lots of different issues that my research hopes to investigate. And the, the colonies, uh, the, the bacteria that are present on these microbiotic surfaces has been called the plastosphere. So for my masters, I wanted to investigate the plastosphere. So my master's work was titled The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Plastosphere, which I was very proud of. And uh, basically all we wanted to answer was, well, we have lots of different sources of microplastics getting into the environment. Some are already in sewage. So could they be more um, you know, hazardous compared to other sources of microplastics? So are microplastics from different sources selectively colonized by disease causing organisms or potentially drug resistant organisms. When I say selectively colonized, I basically mean is a bad bug choosing to live on microplastics than anything else in the environment, making microplastics more hazardous than other materials. And just on the screen here, you can see this is an agar plate, which is basically a plastic dish that has a very nutrient rich jelly in it. And inside that jelly is basically everything bacteria need to, to survive. So we see them grow on the agar and we can see what's happening. So just to kind of show you uh, a bit of inspiration for my research, on this agar plate, we have four different types of microplastics, all from different sources. And you can see just by looking, there's clearly, there's clearly a bacteria on there, but also they vary very much according to source and type of microplastic. And this one that you can see zoomed in here, it's got some sort of horrible fungal spore growing off it. And this is literally just sampled from the river in Truro. So uh, I dread to think what's really there. But it, this, as I say, really inspired my research because you can see that there's clearly something interesting going on. So to investigate this, and I won't go into a huge amount of details here, but basically what we wanted to do was take microplastics from the environment. So, you know, these, these are environments that we regularly beach clean, for example. So we know that these are environmentally relevant particles. So we took three different types of microplastics and they're all from totally different sources. So these black particles up the top here, these are what we call bio beads. And these are used to filter sewage. So these are really prevalent in sewage. And these are primary microplastics. So remember that means that they're made to be small in size. The second particles that you see here, these are the nurdles, the industrial feedstock to plastic pollution. Every piece of plastic starts off like this. So if you want to make a plastic bottle, for example, you need 600 of these all melted together. So that's from a totally different source. These are from the plastics industry. And again, they're primary microplastics. They're made to be small in size. And finally, we have fragments. So these are our secondary particles. They started off as something big and now are small because of the environmental degradation. So we have three totally different particles, but they were all sourced from the environment. And what we had to do was uh, uh, take them into the lab and do something called autoclaving, which basically means you kill everything that's there. We made them totally sterile. But what was really important is that we needed the, them to be from the environment because Research has shown that naturally aged, so environmentally aged particles are more likely to be colonized 
by disease causing bacteria and drug resistant bacteria. So the longer a particle has been in the environment, the more dangerous it can potentially become. So we've got our particles totally clean, no bacteria on them. We then put them into um, tubes that contained a sewage community. So I went to Falmouth Wastewater Treatment Plant, I took some sewage and I extracted the bacteria from that sewage and then put my microplastics in it. And we know that this is an important thing to investigate because we know that microplastics uh, are coexisting with this sewage community in the real world. So then now we've got these nice juicy biofilms formed on my microplastics. We want to see, well, what's chosen to live where? Are there gonna be more disease causing bugs on these particles than these particles and so on? So we then needed to take the biofilms off of the microplastics again to investigate what's been happening. So we bashed these biofilm communities off of the particles and then we plated them. So took this kind of biofilm community and spread it on agar plates. Remember, this is that nutrient jelly that's going to help the bacteria to grow. And we used a special kind of agar, which selects for E. coli. So it has the exact conditions E. coli need to grow. And we can see how much E. coli is there by counting these colonies. So these each purple dot is an E. coli, for example. So we would take the biofilms off the microplastics, spread it on the plate, and then count how much is there, basically. But what we can do with these agar plates is we can put some antibiotics in the jelly too, which means that if an E. coli was to grow, it's growing in the presence of these antibiotics. So we know that that E. coli is resistant to that drug. So I had three different antibiotics to see if each particle had um, different drug resistances to different drugs, basically, um, focusing on E. coli. And then the final thing that I did after I've seen, well, is there more or less drug resistance on these particles, is I was able to do something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to see if the um, E. coli that were present in the biofilms were more or less likely to be disease causing. So remember back at the start, we have separate, seven different types of E. coli, five of them are harmless, two of them are pathogenic. So using this method, I was able to see if they were the pathogenic types or not. And this just basically shows you what I was looking for in that. So I would um, amplify the genes that were present in my E. coli, and then run them on um, a, a gel called, ge and this process is called gel electrophoresis, and it would spread out all of the genes. And I basically say, yep, that one looks like a, a D group of E. coli, and that means it's pathogenic. So that's, it's um, obviously a lot more complex than that, but basically I was just looking for path, um, disease causing bugs or not. Now, this slide is awful, it's so ugly, and you probably can't read it very well because it's very small, so I'm going to talk you through it, but this is basically what my results of my masters found. As I say, don't look too much into it, but basically, when I could compare my E. coli colonies between different particles, I could see which ones were more likely to have disease-causing bugs on them. So when we looked at biofilm communities versus free living. So this is the bacteria that chose to remain growing in the, in the liquid compared with the bacteria that are present on the microplastics. And what my analysis found was that 50% of the E. coli that were in the biofilms were disease causing. However, half that amount, so about 26% of the bacteria that were floating around in the liquid were disease causing. So therefore we can say, okay, the E. coli that are present in the biofilm are more likely to be disease causing than the ones that are free living. Therefore, biofilm associated bacteria on microplastics could potentially be more disease causing than those that remain free living in the environment. 
And then when we start looking at the differences between each particle, so again, really zooming in here, when we look at the biobeads, so these are the particles that are from the sewage, for example, 64% of the colonies that I investigated of E. coli were disease causing. But then when we look at the nurdles, again, it's about half, so 28% of the colonies were disease causing. So we can say that bio beads, which are from sewage, so more likely to encounter E. coli and potentially um, antibiotics, so that selection pressure, bio beads are more concerning in terms of uh, disease causing organisms and carrying disease causing organisms than, for example, nurdles. And we can use this to sort of inform waste management, if you like, or maybe informing cleanup efforts. If the bio beads are more hazardous in terms of being colonized by disease causing organisms, then we need to think about maybe using a different particle or, or focusing on cleaning these ones up above everything else. And then finally, when we looked at whether um, drug resistance came into play here, we looked at, we compared drug resistant bacteria and non-drug resistant bacteria. And we looked at whether drug resistant bacteria were more likely to be disease causing or not. And the overarching finding that we found was that there were more antibiotic resistant disease causing organisms in the biofilms than non-resistant. So probably the worst kind of case scenario is, is what we found. But what's really important to note here is that this work is very much preliminary, which is why I needed to do my PhD to really investigate this further. So now I'm doing basically the exact same thing, but with loads more different types of particles from lots more different um, sources and doing lots and lots more repl replication, just so we can really kind of solidify the findings here. So I'll just kind of briefly go over what I'm doing now with my PhD. So whilst that is kind of terrifying enough, um, showing that potentially these microplastics are, are getting colonized by disease causing organisms, what I'm more interested in looking at now is actually, okay, well, if we've got these disease causing bugs on microplastics, is there anything about the microplastic that is making it more or less likely to evolve this resistance? You know, the worst case scenario is where we have these superbugs where they would cause disease in humans, but then we can't treat it with antibiotics. So how, how can we begin to address these, um, these diseases? So there are certain things about microplastics that would make the evolution of drug resistance more likely. And this is what I'm going to explore with my PhD. And this goes back to remember at the start thinking about selection pressure. If there's antibiotic concentrations present, then this could be um, encouraging the evolution of antimicrobial resistance. So microplastics do certain things to make the um, concentrations of antibiotics more present. And I'm just going to run through these very quickly now. So just to kind of summarize the three things that make microplastics so concerning is that um, in many plastics, antimicrobials or antibiotics are added into the plastic. So for example, one of the greatest sources of microplastics is paint. And if you imagine when you, you're painting something, it will likely have an antibiotic or an antimicrobial present in the paint to try and stop bugs growing on it. So they literally put antibiotics or antimicrobials into paint. And that's polymer-based paint, so plastic-based paint. So when it chips off, those um, microplastics that are pumped full of antibiotics go into the environment. And as we know, when they're in the environment, they get colonized by bacteria. That bacteria then are exposed to that selection pressure and they could be evolving antimicrobial resistance. The second um, kind of hazard that microplastics pose is that they almost act like magnets for pollutants in the environment. So when a microplastic goes into the environment, 
any toxins that are in the water surrounding that microplastic will absorb to the microplastic exactly like a, a magnet would kind of uh, attract things to it. And I'll go into more detail, but basically if a microplastic goes into an environment where there's antibiotics present, they absorb to the microplastic and then you've got a big concentration of antibiotics on that microplastic. And again, if the bacteria colonize that microplastic, they're exposed to the selection pressure and could evolve drug resistance. And then the final area for concern is that within biofilms, these organisms are living very close to each other. So they could exchange genetic information, potentially drug resistance genes. So research has found that the bacteria present in biofilms have an increased rate of genetic transfer of information um, uh, as opposed to free living um, versions of the same species. So I've just got a few kind of points to, to outline here running through each one. So when you look at the additives, as I said, if there are antimicrobials present in the plastic, it's increasing the selection pressure for resistance. And there are loads and loads of these additives put into plastics during, the, uh, during manufacture. So for example, in this picture here, on the right-hand side, there's a film, a plastic film with an antibiotic inside or an antimicrobial. And you can see it's prohibited the growth of lots of these organisms. So you can see just how kind of high concentration these antimicrobials are in the plastic, as opposed to a, a plastic film that has no antimicrobials in. And then this is kind of uh, quite a complex slide, so I won't kind of dwell on, on loads of it, but essentially, you know, this stat here, concentrations of heavy metals on microplastics can be over 600 times those found in seawater. So this really highlights the ability for microplastics to act as those magnets of just concentrating pollutants in the environment. And then finally, as I say, when you have these um, bacteria in high concentrations in the biofilms, they have this increased transfer of genetic information. And bacteria are so good at evolving drug resistance because they have this capability of doing something called horizontal gene transfer. And this is the transfer of genetic information between totally unrelated strains or even different species. You know, for human evolution, we rely on vertical gene transfer. So from parent to offspring, offspring. but bacteria can, can pass genetic information to to totally kind of unrelated strains in, in the same generation. So research has found that the transfer of these drug resistant genes can be three times higher in microplastic biofilms than in the environment. So there's so much kind of at play that's leading to the evolution of drug resistance in these um, microplastic attached communities. So then finally, what does this actually mean? We've kind of highlighted the worst case scenario in every sort of instance here where, you know, we've got disease causing organisms attaching themselves to microplastics. And we've got lots and lots of different things that are making those bacteria more likely to evolve drug resistance. But what does that actually mean? Well, we know that microplastics are highly persistent plastics don't degrade. So these microplastic attached communities can persist in the environment for, for significantly longer than if they were attached to wood, for example. And that means that this can, these microplastics can transport these sort of islands of pathogens and drug resistant bacteria into new environments or pristine environments. But they could also be transporting these um, attached microbial reefs into the food chain. So we know that microplastics get ingested by fish, for example. We also know that a microplastic is more likely to be eaten if it's covered in a biofilm because it sort of gives off the, the sort of natural scent 
um, to, to the predator or the, the, the animal that's eating it. So could those drug resistant disease causing organisms go into the fish, for example? And then what does that mean for us as apex predators at the top of that food chain? Are we then going to be ingesting these drug resistant organisms? Does that make us more likely to have drug resistant infections? So, I mean, that final question is definitely postdoc level. I won't get to that with my PhD, but this is sort of the kind of area that I'm, I'm hoping to sort of um, indicate towards. So that was probably a huge amount of information there of everything that I hope to investigate with my PhD. And of course, a lot of it was kind of doom and gloom and it's absolutely not the case. You know, there's a lot of fantastic research uh, at the university here to, to find alternatives to uh, the antibiotics we use or to combat drug resistance. And of course, lots of work in industry and in, in communities to tackle plastic pollution. So it's not, but uh, it's not all doom and gloom. But I must end by saying a massive thank you to my supervisors for, for taking me on as a PhD student and helping infuse this, uh, this research. And of course, thank you to all of you again for inviting me to talk. And if you have any questions at all, um, I will try my best to answer them. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, yeah, it's always a pleasure hearing you speak and usually it's all very very inspirational I think today the outlook was sounded a bit more bleak but that just goes to highlight the importance of your research I think and you've given us a great overview of what you've done already and even what you plan to do and as I as you said there's even plans for beyond PhD so you're definitely thinking of the big picture there um yeah so at this point I would like to invite um anyone in the audience to pose any questions and um, you can put them in the chat in the chat box um if you're willing to ask the question directly on video, um, please do um, indicate so in the chat, or I think the group is um, hopefully manageable enough that um, you feel free to unmute yourself and just directly ask a question uh, if there's a break. Um, otherwise, while you're all coming up with questions and um, getting ready to type something into the chat, I'm going to um, take my prerogative to ask a question myself. Um, first, as full disclosure, I'm a microbiologist as well, so uh, it would be extra good to get some other questions to you to have some different responses as well. Um, so Emily, you mentioned uh, the um, microplastics um, that you used in your master's research were particularly those that you got from the environment so that they were aged naturally. And so that this is a big difference in terms of how bacteria can colonize them and that fresh microplastics just aren't as good. I was wondering if you know why that's the case, why bacteria just prefer these older microplastics? Yeah, so um, we think that it's, so with my PhD, we're now sort of trying to investigate whether it's the microplastics that's making them these disease causing organisms or drug resistant organisms, or if it is just this surface attachment. So we're now including wood and glass as co comparators to see because when the bacteria are attaching to the surface, we think that the sort of um, the attachment properties of that bacteria is what's inducing this like virulence and disease causing about them so if there's more area to colonize that's making them more pathogenic so the aged particles are becoming more colonized by disease causing organisms because there's simply a greater surface area or a more kind of diverse surface area or they've been in the environment for longer and therefore have been concentrating all of these sort of um, additives and toxins and that could be playing a role as well. So uh, as part of my PhD, we're hoping to also investigate this further and have some virgin particles. So totally new particles, literally just been developed um, and then compare them to these aged particles. And that will be really interesting because if they've only just been manufactured, then you'd think that they, whilst you know they don't have this kind of diverse surface and it would be totally sort of smooth, they could be pumped full of these additives. So it'd be really interesting to see the difference between aged and, and virgin particles. Great, thank you, Emily. 
Uh, we've had a few questions come in the chat now. I'm going to go ahead and pull one from Henry straight away because that's kind of related to what I just asked. So Henry says, fascinating, and asks um, if bacteria colonize other small particles, such as shell, seaweed, sand, and wood. And if so, uh, can you say anything about how the pathogenicity maybe of the bacteria um, compares between these different um, particles? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great point, Henry. And, and as I kind of said in my previous um, answer, everything that goes into the environment will be colonized by bacteria you know colonization is not a totally new thing that's exclusive to plastic when wood is in the environment when plants are in the environment when there's sand and shells and seaweed these will all be being colonized by bacteria but even if for example so with my phd now as i said i'm including wood even if we see that there are more pathogens on wood than plastics, plastics are still going to be more hazardous because that wood isn't going to last in the environment. It's not going to be transported in the environment because as soon as it's saturated, it's sinking to the sea floor and that's where it will start to decompose. Whereas plastic doesn't do that. It will start, it will, as we say, persist, move around, float into different environments. It may move up and down the, the water column, but ultimately it's going to be in that environment forever. So it, it can sort of pose risks in, in many different ways. In terms of the, the colonization of, of pathogenicity, again, as I was saying to David, the more kind of diverse a surface is, we seem to be seeing more pathogens. And obviously wood is a highly diverse substrate. So my research that I'm currently doing now may well show that there are more pathogens on wood, for example, than plastic. But as I said, that's nowhere near um, as, as sort of hazardous as, as plastic in terms of transportability um, and that side of things. So watch this space because I've got wood now and I'll be able to tell you. <laughs> We're gonna have to invite you on again in a few months time or, <laughs> or a bit longer. So um, I think most of the, uh, or a lot of the other questions kind of center about, um, this is all great. So you've had obviously some fantastic comments, um, amazing presentation and really highlights the problem, as I already said, but what's the good news really? So uh, Robin kind of summed, summed this up with, if it's not all doom and gloom, what is the good news? Uh, I won't let you answer that straight away. We're gonna address some of the other questions first. And if you would like to know more after that, Robin, then do please indicate that. Um, so some of the more specific questions here. So Joe and um, Karen asked something quite similar, asking about the microbeads and that water companies and sewage plants use them. Um, can they, is there plans to stop using these? Can they stop using them uh, to make the whole thing less harmful to the environment? Yeah, so, I mean, that would, it seems like a really sensible solution and hopefully, you know, from my research, I could approach sort of wastewater treatment plants and, and companies and say, you know, my research has shown that bio beads, for example, are potentially more likely to be colonized by these pathogenic drug resistant bacteria so could we look at alternatives uh, i think southwest water have about over 250 wastewater treatment plants in operation only nine of them use bio beads so very few wastewater treatment plants actually use this method to deal with the sewage um, so you know it's it's not as, as severe as, you know, as imagining, you know, all 250 of them are using these bio beads and there's <laughs> loads and loads of bio beads getting into the environment. Um, the, the thing about using the plastics to treat sewage is it's actually a highly efficient way to deal with sewage. It's really cheap. It's very, has a very low um, carbon cost. So it doesn't emit any carbon really whatsoever, except from the actual production of the plastic. And, and it, it, it's just a very efficient way to deal with our sewage. The problem lies when these particles escape into the environment. So even if we don't advise to change the particles completely, we can look at changing the infrastructure supporting the particles. So making sure that storm um, sort of combined sewer overflows are going to capture the, the bio beads if they're you know, spilling into the environment and that kind of thing. And some of these spills can be really severe. So in 2010, a wastewater treatment plant on the Truro River 
uh, one of the sort of grids that was holding the bio beads in one of the sewage reactors broke due to you know sort of unforeseen damage and five billion of the bio beads went into the warp into the river in Truro and you can still see them there now you know there's this thick crust of plastic pellets all along the riverbank there in Truro so it is essential that even if we you don't see water companies changing away from these particles. We make sure that the infrastructure can support the use of these particles. Right, thank you. That's very interesting. Um, good to hear that there's ways to um, keep them contained even if they can fail. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to actually hook on one of my own questions though, just because it fits really nicely. Um, so I was wondering. Um, there's in your research or if you're aware of anything looking at um, adding extra treatment steps to wastewater treatments to maybe not just remove the bio beads but also remove other microplastics that you might find. Yeah, so I mean, people have investigated whether you have different sized meshes and, and sort of sieves to try and get the plastics out of wastewater. The problem is, is that one of the greatest um, types of microplastics in wastewater are fibers from our clothing. And this is one of the worst kind of um, pl plastic pollutants we see. You know, it's estimated that per one wash of your washing machine can emit up to 700,000 plastic microfibers. And you think that's just one person's wash. How many people do a wash every day, every week? And then that's sending all of that gray water into the wastewater. And the wastewater treatment plants are not designed to capture microfibers at all. So essentially all 700,000 of those could be going into the environment. So it's not just about adding in additional steps at the wastewater treatment plants, but also could we look at the, the sources to the wastewater treatment plants? Could we be putting microfiber filters on our washing machines? Could we be putting additional filters in our toilets or in our showers? And, you know, at all the other steps that are emitting these microplastic particles. Yeah, great, plenty to think about. Uh, plenty of different <laughs> companies involved in a reaction to that as well, I imagine. Um, so Maria's asking something about the more uh, individual level. Um, do you know what the best thing is that individuals can do against microplastic pollution in the environment, especially because they're found in such surprising things like paint and are there in such high levels? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the good thing is that we're seeing a much greater transparency for this kind of thing. You know, up until 2017, we were still selling um, cosmetics with microbeads, plastic microbeads in here in the UK. Now legislation has passed that you can't sell um, products with plastic microbeads in in the UK. I mean, these things, these products were ridiculous. You could be sending 100 thousand microplastics down the drain per shower you have so legislation definitely helps but on the individual level because people are now aware of microplastics in various things you can often look at a label and, and see whether it contains these microplastics or not or quite often you know businesses are, are using this to kind of sell their products and they say this is microplastic free so it's it is a case of, as well as kind of relying on legislation to make it easier for us and banning these things outright, as an individual, we can look at what we're buying and making sure it is microplastic free. Awesome, thanks. Very good uh, specific call to action, which I like. Yeah, but also, um, of course, you know, as I said, there's two different types of microplastics, the primary, the small ones that are already in the stuff, but also the secondary particles that come from the breakdown or break up of larger items. So if we stop, you know, just by doing a beach clean and collecting plastic bottles, you're reducing microplastics in the ocean because ultimately that plastic bottle is going to become hundreds of thousands of microplastics. So addressing plastic pollution in general is addressing microplastic pollution. That's a great point as well. Thank you. Um, Karen had another question that's more for an individual level as well. 
Um, Karen asks, is there any way we can be sure that fish or food we eat are from a low microbeads area? Yeah, I mean, this isn't really my area of expertise. It would be amazing if we had sort of like a, a database or something that we could tap into and be like, is this a hot spot or no? I can't remember the exact stat. I think the average seafood consumer uh, consumes it's either 11,000 microplastics a week, a month, or a year. I can't remember, but you know, <laughs> I think the, the most concerning sort of uh, diet would be shellfish consuming because, of course, you eat the whole organism. So, for example, mussels filter feed uh, microplastics out of the water column. And if you eat that entire muscle, you are gonna be ingesting those microplastics. Fish, not so much of a concern because a lot of the fish we eat, we remove the gut and, and there's kind of not um, concrete evidence that the actual particles will transmit from the gut into the soft tissue. However, uh, the toxins from the microplastics can then get into the soft tissues. So it's not just about worrying about the microplastics that you're eating, but also all of the toxins that are on the microplastics that you're eating. Well, at least with the uh, removal of the gut, that's um, some good news and um, yeah, something good to consider as well. Yeah. Um, just as a reference to your uh, previous answer, uh, Marija just put in the chat that there's actually a mobile app for scanning your cosmetic products if they have plastic microbeads. It's called Beat the Microbead. Um, mm -hmm. You can also scan the barcode and help in the process. So that might be something for people to check out. You should be able to find the comment in the chat. Brilliant. Um, great. Uh, if you're still willing, we've got a big long uh, question coming up from Winnie. Um, Winnie, if I don't do this justice, please do feel free to come on and interrupt me. So Winnie says, thank you for the presentation, Emily. Really interesting talk. Do you have any idea about the viability of the microbes on plastics? For example, how long they may persist in the environment and whether they may actually transfer to species that ingest them. Surely there are other environmental sources of these bacteria, um, including pathogens. Do you have any idea about the relative contribution of plastics against other sources? Yeah. OK. Um, so. In terms of the viability of microbes on microplastics, there is very little sort of evidence um, supporting this. And that's because this is kind of a totally novel area of research. If I was to, exam for example, uh, look at the survivab survivability of E. coli on microplastics. So one experiment I'm hoping to look at is grow an E. coli biofilm on some microplastics put it into the environment and see how long it would last. The problem with that is that in the lab, I'm using optimum conditions to grow E. coli as you know, a, a sort of um, human associated bacteria, it's optimum temperature for growth is 37 degrees, temperature of the human body. In the ocean, here in Cornwall, it's not 37 degrees. So when an E. coli attached to that bacteria gets into the environment, it's very low temperature, low nutrient. How well is it going to survive realistically? The thing that concerns me is that when these bacteria are in a biofilm, they're protected. And you actually see more biofilm formation in these harsher environments because a biofilm is a survival technique. So even though you might think, you know, if I just put an E. coli bug into the environment, into the sea, it might not last because it's not optimum conditions. But if it's in a biofilm on a microplastic, it's got a better chance of survival than if it was just free living. So having those microplastics in the sewage pollution makes these bacteria more likely to survive, more likely to spread. But as I say, this is really sort of novel research and, and hopefully with my PhD, I'll be able to investigate how long or how, how likely they are to survive. Was there any other questions? Uh, just about other environmental sources and any idea of the relative contribution of plastics against um, 
yeah, other sources yeah. of bacteria. Yeah, so I mean, there's absolutely loads of sources of, of different bacteria to the environment. And of course, these bacteria, different bacteria naturally kind of occur in these environments. My research focuses on E. coli just because I think it's interesting where we have this overlap of conditions in sewage. But I originally was going to look at Vibrio, which is um, a fish pathogen or is a, a pathogen for shellfish, for example. So if we can, if we see sort of um, Vibrio growing on microplastics and then those microplastics are then ingested by mussels, then the pathogens in the muscle and we'd be ingesting that. So, um, yeah, there are lots and lots of different sources of lots and lots of different species, but I'm afraid I'm no expert on any of them. I'm, I'm not even a really an expert on E. coli and sewage at this stage. I think you're answering the questions impressively enough to say you're not an expert on E. coli and sewage um, or any of the other work. Um, great. So after this very hardcore question, I'm going to um, shove in one that's a bit more, well, fun is probably the wrong word, but I'm guessing this was in reference to the discussion earlier when you talked about the leakage of the wastewater treatment plant in Truro. Um, Susanna's um, saying, uh, shouldn't Southwest Water clean up their goo? I wonder if you want to comment on that and maybe um, or there, do you know if there's any plans to clean up this dark plastic along the coast that you mentioned? Yeah, so I should say that um, when the spill happened, Southwest Water did go out and try to collect as many of these particles as they possibly could. Um, but of course, as we continually say throughout this presentation, microplastics persist and are transported. So even though they went out and tried to gather as much as they possibly could, a lot of the damage had already been done and, and they'd sort of escaped into the environment. Um, so they did do to do something and they continually support cleanup efforts. So they've supported Beach Guardian in the past and they also support um, oh my goodness, what's that name? Beach Care is an arm of Keep Britain Tidy. So um, I think they're very keen on, on making sure their environmental impact is, is limited. Um, but yeah, the, the particles are still in the environment. As well. so, but there's always more that everyone can, can do. That is no, actually perfect. great to know though. Glad they um, acknowledge that. Yeah, they didn't just do yep. nothing. <laughs> that is very good indeed. Um, next up, we've got another question from Steve, um, who asks, are there any plans to include microplastics from tire wear in your future studies? And do you know how different they are in nature to the plastics that you have already looked at? Yeah, so tire wear um, particles, uh, I believe there was a research, there was a, a publication that came out last year that said um, particles from tires is one of the greatest inputs of microplastics to the environment. I can't remember the stats or, or any kind of um, detailed information, but wear from tires is, is an extreme con contributor to microplastic pollution. And of course, my, when I think of that, alarm bells already go off because I'm thinking of all of the um, sort of additives that are put into um, tires and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm not an expert on the kind of, um, you know, nature of these particles at all, but I was thinking literally last week that what could be interesting to include in my research is whether uh, what we're seeing with pathogens and drug resistance with my particles, are we going to see the same if it was, for example, neoprene? Um, because as um, you know, obviously lots of surfers are wearing neoprene wetsuits, do they get colonized by bacteria? Are particles coming off of wetsuits then you know, transporting uh, these bacteria? And uh, research from the University of Exeter, a researcher called um, Dr. Anne Leonard, she did a survey called the, the Beach Bum Survey, where she essentially took well, she didn't take the rec rectal swabs, I don't think, but she asked surfers to get rectal swabs so she could look at the colonization of, of surfers um, and, and see if they were more colonized by drug resistant E. coli than non-water users. And I can't remember the stats exactly, but she found 
pretty much exactly that, that's people that use the ocean recreationally, so surfers and swimmers, those that ingest water are more likely to be colonized by drug resistant E. coli than those that aren't. So we know surfers are exposed to these bacteria. What about what they're wearing? Is that gonna sort of um, play into this at all? So yeah, that doesn't really answer your tire question, but <laughs> I don't really know about tires. <laughs> Very interesting, nonetheless. <laughs> um, it seems like we do have some uh, other researchers in the uh, in the audience. So uh, Winnie just put another um, comment saying she's a researcher herself and um, commenting your work is very interesting. Basically, um, do go back and look at that. It's a very uh, very nice comment. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go back to a question back from Harry, who is also uh, currently researching abundance and uh, quantities of sediments using samples from beaches in Cornwall as a student at Loughborough University. And Harry says, from his findings so far, and research from others around microplastics and sediments, the main type of plastic, at least in terms of number, have been fibers, as you have mentioned. And then asks, has your research um, looked specifically at the impact of these fibers and antibiotic resistance, considering they seem to be the most prevalent? Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, I haven't used microfibers. I am desperate to include microfibers, especially because of their importance in sewage. Now, even when I've got the sewage in the lab and I'm looking at it in the tubes, I can literally see the microfibers in there. So I'm desperate to investigate this. But um, my research is looking at kind of the bigger particles just to start with. So my particles really are sort of on the uh, the the um the barrier between microplastics and macroplastics they're about four millimeters in size which just makes it easier to uh, manipulate them in the lab and to get the biofilms off of them the microfibers would be significantly harder for me to work with but i know that there are researchers at plymouth marine labs who work with very small particles like nanoplastics so they would be able to uh, look at the microfibers so maybe later on in my PhD I will start to look at the microfibers particularly as I'm interested in looking at the transfer um, in in organisms you know if a muscle ingests uh, a microplastic what then happens I wouldn't be able to use my four millimeter particles for that because they're too big so I'd have to move on to something smaller and I'm really considering using microfibers so um, I'm not using them yet but I would love to. <laughs> right, I find it really interesting that you can literally see the abundance of them in your samples. Um, yeah, David, yeah. I'll show you, like we've got poopsicles in the freezer right now. And every time I take a little bit off, I've got a little pellet of fibers in the bottom of them. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, that, that is amazing. Um, thank you. Um, it seems to be slowing down gradually in the chat in terms of new questions. Um, I've got another one of my own that I want to ask. And then after that, I will go back to Robin's um, to more of the kind of lift spirits at the end, I guess, um, if you have any other comments you want to make there. So I was wondering, um, obviously, through your work uh, with Beach Guardian, um, you've been mainly exposed to bigger plastics and plastic bottles and things like that, beaches. And now you're working so much with microplastics. So what do you personally now see as more worrying or more of an area of concern that needs to be addressed? So um, I'm going to absolutely steal a metaphor that was used by, oh, I forget her name right, Dame Sally Davies, the, um, what, what was her role? She's like the ex head of, I can't remember, I'm going to quote this so poorly, but basically Dame Sally Davies was the UK special envoy for AMR, that's the one, and she uses this analogy to describe COVID and antimicrobial resistance. She says that um, COVID or uh, COVID-19 is like putting a lobster into a boiling pot of water. It's very aggressive, it's very violent, it's very loud, and of course, the lobster dies. Whereas antimicrobial resistance is like having a lobster and putting it into a cold pot and slowly bringing it to the boil. It's quiet, it's sinister, it's like this silent death, and of course, the lobster still dies. And I feel the same about microplastics and larger plastic items. So 
fishing nets, for example, are like the boiling pot of water. Everything dies and it's very violent and aggressive and loud. And you can see this kind of violent reaction happening. Microplastics are like this silent tsunami, which everyone uses for AMR. But I think it's even more pertinent for microplastics, seeing as it's you know in the marine environment. Microplastics are that cold pot of water that's being slowly brought to the boil. The lobster's still gonna die, but we're all blissfully unaware about it. Our bodies are being pumped full of microplastics every single day and <laughs> they're slowly killing us. <laughs> so I see larger items and microplastics both as issues, but definitely the microplastics are much more sinister. Wow, thank you. I'm very pleased to ask that question. That was a <laughs> <laughs> perfectly eloquent answer. Thoroughly enjoyed it, even though it was uh, <laughs> quite <Rachel. laughs> um, Great. Uh, sorry, just had one more thing pop into it. Yeah, such a good metaphor. Um, it's not know. mine. Dame Sally Davies did that one. <laughs> um, yeah, so after that, I think um, the other thing I will ask is um, go back to Robin's question from earlier. Um, if it's not all doom and gloom, what is the good news? Is there anything else you want to tell us about the good news about all of this? <laughs> Well, the good news is that there is some incredible research finding the most bizarre ways to, to combat AMR, such as, David, your research is lots of good news, <laughs> which I would not be able to explain at all. Um, but I think it's just very exciting. And, and not that I'm sort of egging on the apocalypse at all, but I think in the face of all of these sort of tragedies and and issues facing human health and environmental health. The opportunity for innovation and research, research has never been greater. And I think especially for young people, you know, we see all the time this eco-anxiety amongst young people, this, this fear of inheriting the damaged planet and, you know, is there any hope? But also that's inspiring so many young people going into research and, and you know, innovating solutions to this. And I think that is a massive positive. And I absolutely feel that that research and that innovation is going to drive the change that we need to, you know, find new antibiotics and, um, you know, develop different ways of treating drug resistant infections. And then also combating the plastic pollution crisis whilst also combating climate change. So there is definitely still hope. And research like this shouldn't, whilst it is kind of, you know, doom and gloom, it shouldn't always be seen as a negative because the positive, of course, is that we know this stuff now. The more we find out about this, the more we can do to target it. If I, you know, not blowing my trumpet at all, but if I wasn't doing this research, then or other people weren't doing research like this, then we don't know that microplastics used in wastewater treatment are posing this risk. And now we know we can find alternatives or do things to limit the impact. So uh, even though it seems tragic, uh, there's positivity in that tragedy. Great, thank you very much, Emily. Um, so you have had plenty of more um, positive comments in the chat, including a quite cynical one with still um, positivity about your talk um, right at the end there. So do go back um, and look at them and um, don't just leave off. Uh, otherwise, I think, seeing as we've slowed down in questions and we have um, stolen your time for well over an hour now, Emily, I think I will wrap it up here. Um, just some housekeeping things that I did want to mention, seeing as we've got an audience now, we're hoping to put on another event next month. That's still in the works. At the moment, the next scheduled talk is on the 13th of April um, about seagrass monitoring and restoration by Dr. Ian Hendy. So another marine themed one. If you aren't yet signed up to our mailing list, then um, you've got the link in the chats there. So you'll be kept up to date with all the events. And um, other than that, the last thing for me to do is I'm going to ask everyone to unmute so that we can give Emily a huge big round of applause, seeing as she's done such a brilliant work uh, with this talk. So please unmute yourself and join in a big round of applause. Thank you.